Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today I have my new friend, Paul Smalley. Paul, welcome to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, can you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your life, marriage, ministry, and those types of things? Sure. Well, I mean, the most important thing to uh, know about me, to paraphrase Ephesians 2, is I was dead in my sentence. But uh, God saved me by his grace, um, not because of any works that I've done. And now I'm his workmanship, created in Christ to do the good works that he's created or prepared beforehand for me to do. Um, God drew me to his son when I was 18 years old, and he's been very merciful to me since then. One of his uh, great mercies to me is my wife, Dawn. Uh, we've been married for 19 years now. And um God gave me the privilege of serving as a pastor in different Baptist churches around the Midwestern United States for a number of years. And uh, then 11 years ago, we moved here to Grand Rapids so that I could start working as the faculty teaching assistant to Dr. Joel Beakey at Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary. And it's been a great blessing to be here. That's wonderful. Uh, what a what an incredible blessing to work under Dr. Beakey. And to yes, work it is. With him. Yes. Yes. Well, can you uh, tell us about this book that you've written? It's uh, volume three in the series, Reform Systematic Theology, Spirit and Salvation. Um, why you guys both wrote it and how you hope it'll be received or maybe how you think it'll be received. <laughs> since right. You're not, since you're not speaking for Dr. Beakey. <laughs> no, I can't speak for Dr. Beakey. Um, Reform Systematic Theology is our effort to present the classic teachings of the Christian faith in a way that is biblical doctrinal, experiential, and practical. Uh, back in 2016, Dr. Beeky and I um, made a major revision of his lectures on soteriology, it's a doctrine of salvation. We were thinking about possibly publishing the material. Well, God was pleased to bless our efforts, and so we expanded the project to include a full systematic theology which Crossway has now graciously been publishing. Um, what we're talking about here is the third of four volumes in the set. It focuses on how the Holy Spirit applies the redemption purchased by Christ to save and sanctify us as individual people. Um, and, uh, you know, it has three basic sections. Uh, the first section focuses on the work of the Holy Spirit in the history of salvation. Uh, for example, his ministry to the church since Pentecost. Then the second section talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the order of salvation, of the series of things that God does to um, save individual people, like regenerating them, giving them the new birth. And then the last section is on the experience of salvation, um, such as the Spirit indwelling us and making himself known and testifying to our spirits that we're children of God and producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So what we really want and pray for is that God would use this book to ground people um, in the sound teachings of God's Word, um, inform them with the doctrines of the Christian faith, especially as they were expressed through the Reformers and the Puritans, um, so they can be able to discern the experience of God working in their own hearts and also so that they could live in practical obedience to God's commands. Really, the purpose of theology is so that we would live for the glory of God. You might think of Reformed Systematic Theology as theology in the form of a sermon that is speaking to people's hearts and lives. Mm, that's really good. Really good. Yeah, the thing I like about this series is head, heart, and hands, you know? Mm. It's not just, okay, well, this is a systematic theology book, so it's it's dry and it's dusty and um, you know, just <laughs> put it on the bookshelf back there and, you know, whoop, whoop, you know, dust it off when you when you need a technical answer. It's it's eminently, as you said, eminently practical, 
but it's eminently practical because it's eminently theological and we know theology is for all of life. So I really, I really like this, this series. That's why I personally like this series. Why I, I think it's probably one of the best systematic theologies out there. <laughs> then again, I, I, I love Dr. Beaky and appreciate you working with him. So, you know, anyway, what are, what are some of the dangers of a wrong view of the Holy Spirit today? Well, of course, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. So he's God. And um, Jeremiah 9, 24 tells us that there's nothing more important than the knowledge of God. That's the only thing worth boasting in. And so if we have a wrong view of the Holy Spirit to begin with, it, we have a distorted view of God, it, it weakens our faith in God, it, it um, creates confusion in our worship. Uh, furthermore, the Holy Spirit is the particular person in the Trinity to whom the application of salvation is appropriated. And so a misunderstanding of the work of the Holy Spirit can lead people to think they're saved because they've had certain experiences when in fact they're not saved. Or on the flip side, it could cause them to doubt their salvation when they really are children of God. Uh, furthermore, people, if they don't understand biblically the work of the Holy Spirit, they might think that the Holy Spirit has given them some special message or power or authority that really doesn't belong to them. And all these things can cause great harm to the church. Absolutely. I appreciate you saying that. I'm, I'm very concerned about, especially the last thing. Uh, well, I, I feel this way. I, I've heard from God. I I have this, like you said, special power or special message. Um, I live four hours away from Four hours south of me is Bethel, uh, Bill Johnson, all that, and and I'm very concerned about that um, mm. because it's 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 distorted, it's it's wrong, it's I think uh, outside the bounds of we would say biblical orthodoxy, uh, what they're what they teach, and um, you know as re as reformed people, I think we whether you're Baptist or Presbyterian or or whatever, uh, you we we. Calvin was the theologian of the Holy Spirit, right? And mm, we have yeah. a good, we have good, a good theology of the Holy Spirit in in our history, and I think we we just have to emphasize that, you know, because it's emphasized in the Bible, it's emphasized in in what we as Reformed people have taught. And I think if we go back to that, I think we can help people really understand, you know, um, on both sides, um, what what the Holy Spirit is is up to who he is and what he's like. So mm. any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we, we desire to honor the Holy Spirit. Um, he is our Lord. He is um, one of the persons of our God. And so we certainly don't want to neglect him or um, avoid his work in any way. And the Holy Spirit does dwell inside of us, which is a wonderful personal thing. And yet it is the Holy Spirit who inspired the Holy Scriptures. And so if we want to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us, we go to the scriptures. Um, and when people make claims of being prophets or apostles today, well, biblically speaking, if you're a prophet, then um, you come forth saying, thus saith the Lord. And if it doesn't happen, you're not a prophet. And nobody really matches that standard anymore. Um, that's something that God gave to us when he laid a foundation for the church, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. Amen. And I mean, the marks of an apostle, right? Mm -hmm. You've you've seen the Lord, you know, personally, face to face, you know, right. not, not not in a, in a, in a vision or, or something. You, you saw him face to face. So. You know, there, there goes that too. You're absolutely right. Amen. Many, many people are greatly confused, you know, about the idea of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, um, mm -hmm. you know, today. And, and they even doubt, you know, this leads to a lot of doubt of their salvation. So how can a Christian know if they have or have not committed this sin? Oh, it is alarming when you read the words of Jesus on this subject. And I think it's intended to be alarming. For example, in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32, our Lord says, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's scary. That's an unforgivable sin. But we, we also need to understand that there's a difference between blaspheming the Holy Spirit and other sins against the Spirit, which may be forgiven. Uh, for example, every unbeliever who hears the gospel and doesn't immediately repent and trust in Christ 
has resisted the spirit of God. But later on in life, by the grace of God, he can repent and trust in the Lord and, and be saved. There's still that possibility. Um, or, for example, again, that many unbelievers um, say blasphemous things about the Holy Spirit. They might deny that he's God or that they might deny that he's a person and say he's just a force. But these are doctrinal heresies that they can be corrected of and, again, by God's grace brought to saving faith. When you look at what Jesus is saying about blaspheming the Holy Spirit in Matthew 12, he's describing an extreme rejection of a very powerful and clear manifestation of God's grace through Jesus Christ, where the Holy Spirit just makes it absolutely clear that Jesus is the Christ and he's blessing people, he's saving people, he's setting them free, and you turn around and treat that like the work of the devil. And the result is a hardness of heart that can never be healed. But these are people that God has shown in a very convincing way that he is good, that Christ is his son, and instead, when people blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they reject Jesus as a servant of Satan and they treat the good things that he does in people's lives as if it were demonic evil. But what that means, though, is that if there's somebody who, who believes that Christ is God's son and that person is concerned and anxious about whether or not he's saved, that means you haven't committed that sin. That shows that your heart is not hardened in that way. So it is a possibility today of people being hardened in this way of blaspheming the Holy Spirit and entering into a kind of final impenitence. But when you're talking about people who are anxious about their salvation and looking to Jesus, that just shows that they haven't actually committed this extreme form of sin. And they shouldn't be concerned about that. Instead, they should be concerned about resting their hearts on Jesus for salvation. Amen, brother. Yeah, that's so good. And I think I think it's just a matter of us being in ministry, you know, and or just you know, maybe the lay person just walking alongside them and asking lots of questions. Okay. What, what, what's, what's really happening here? Like if, if you're, like you said, if you're more concerned about that, you have committed a sin more than likely you haven't. So let's, let's dig in. Let's, let's take a biblical counseling approach and let's ask lots of questions and, and, you know, not to be, you know, like super inquisitive, but just to help them, you know, dig in and find out, you know, what, what's, what's happening here. And I, and I think this this kind of approach is is really helpful. Um, it takes some time to to get to the to the root, but uh, you know most people that come to me and they ask this question, I'm like, mm. the fact that you're asking the question tells me that 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 God is likely at work. You know, tell me, I want to hear more. Of course, mm. um, you know, like what is your understanding of the gospels? Is a good question. Um, you know, how did how did the Lord save you? Okay. All right, you know, th then we can go from there and and move forward, you know, um, those kind of things. So, Yeah, that's very wise. Whenever we're dealing with people and they come to us with a question, it's good to ask more questions and to better understand where they're coming from, because you don't want to apply the wrong medicine to somebody's spiritual illness. But you can only find that if you take the time to really understand. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's a lot of considerations, obviously qualifications, necessary distinctions and all that, that go into this question. But what would you say uh, generically to the person who is struggling with assurance? Mm. Well, I think there's a lot of wisdom to be found on the subject of assurance in the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 18 and and also in its granddaughter document, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, in its own chapter 18. And those documents tell us that based upon scripture, there, there are three different ingredients that need to come together for a person to experience full assurance of faith. There, there's a true understanding of the gospel of Christ. There's a living and productive faith in Christ. And there's also the testifying or witnessing spirit from Christ. So it has to start with grounding yourself in the gospel. I mean, somebody comes and they're worried about their salvation. Do they even understand what salvation is? You need to ask them, do you understand the promises of salvation in the gospel? What do you think the gospel is? Why should God accept you? Are, are you resting in the fact that Christ died for our sins and that he was raised on the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4? Um, do you believe what Paul says in Galatians 2.16, where he says repeatedly 
who are not justified by our obedience to the works of the law, um, our, our obedience in the works of the law, but we're justified through faith in Christ. So first of all, we have to make sure we're standing on solid gospel ground. Um, and second of all, uh, we need to ask whether or not we actually have the inward evidence of a living, saving faith in Christ alone. And the Bible gives us guidelines for that. It talks to us about Well, for example, our Lord Jesus in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 lists a series of characteristics of the people who are the true heirs of his kingdom. And so do I have the kind of faith in Christ that makes me poor in spirit so that I realize that I have nothing to boast in in myself? Um, I'm a sinner. Uh, Do you mourn over your sins? Has that started to produce in your life more of a a gentleness and a meekness towards God and other people instead of constantly demanding your own way? Are you a merciful person? And so on. You know the Beatitudes. Or go and read 1 John. 1 John is an excellent book to diagnose our spiritual condition. It gives us a series of tests to see if we're really Christians. Um, Do you confess your sins to God and acknowledge that you've sinned? Um, Are you walking in general obedience to his commandments? Do you really love other Christians? Um, This isn't rocket science. It's pretty basic stuff. But John just lays it out very clearly there in his first epistle in a series of tests to show us if if we have a real faith that's producing real godliness in our lives. And then lastly, the third ingredient is a recognition that full assurance of faith is not something that we just work up in ourselves. It's actually a gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And so this is a, it's a work of grace. We don't, we don't even deserve to have assurance, but God loves his children, generally speaking, Through the ordinary use of the means of grace, he leads them into a growing assurance. And so you ask yourself, do I experience the Holy Spirit showing me by grace that I'm a child of God? And that is something that you can pray for a a greater work of the Spirit in your life that way. Mm, That's so good. I don't think I have anything to add to that. That's really, really good. Really, really good. Yeah. And I guess I would say maybe one thing, if, if that's you listening uh, maybe you maybe you should go talk to somebody about, you mm-hmm. know, that you should definitely go talk to somebody about this and and realize that talking to somebody about it doesn't mean you're 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 not a Christian. It may mean that and you need to be ready for that, too. Um, but also, I mean, hey, you know what? I, I am actually a Christian, uh, but you need to you need to talk to your pastor or, and a trusted Christian leader who really knows what they're talking about. Um so I guess that's one thing I would say. But what 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 exactly does it mean to be led by the Spirit, and how is it different from the modern notion of needing to hear from God outside of Scripture, or you know, have some sort of mystical, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about, mystical right, thing? Or, right. Right. I felt led to have this interview. Right. Yeah. 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 That sort of thing. Yeah. Um. Well, again, we we need to follow Scripture. And we're not disregarding the work of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit inspired Scripture and the Spirit reveals his own works in Scripture. And so if we want to know what it means to be led by the Spirit, we go back to what the Spirit says in Scripture. Now, for example, it talks in uh, Romans 8, 16, for all those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So this leading is not some unusual experience that sometimes certain very spiritual Christians may have, but others don't. Paul is saying here that to be led by the Spirit is the common experience of all of God's adopted children. It, and that the idea of being led, it, it, it really ties in with the picture of the Christian life as a journey down that narrow road of righteousness on the way to eternal life. In fact, Paul talks about walking uh, in Romans 8, 4. Similarly, Paul talks about being led by the Spirit in Galatians 5, 18. um, And he talks about walking in the Spirit. So it's it's walking down this path. It's an image that is throughout the Bible. The Spirit 
is the one who led Israel through the wilderness on their way to the promised land, um, Isaiah 63, 11. Uh, the Spirit in Luke 4 led Jesus through the wilderness um, on his way to ultimately the cross and then glory. And, and what was going on in the wilderness? What was the issue there? The issue was obedience, obedience to God's commands. And we see the same thing when we talk about um the Spirit leading us in those passages like Romans 8 and Galatians 5, you read those passages, again, you interpret Scripture in context, they say nothing about impulses or feelings or special messages that you get from God. They don't talk about any of that stuff. What do they talk about? They talk about putting sin to death in your life. Uh, they talk about producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, um, and so the leading of the Spirit is not a form of special revelation to show us what God's will is. The leading of the Spirit is his helping us to understand and apply the Word of God to our lives and him motivating us so that we want to obey. And that's the really miraculous thing about the Spirit's work in our lives today. I mean, before I was saved, I knew something about the Bible, but I did not want to obey God. Um, I did not love God. I did not love other people as myself. I just love myself. And so when the Spirit's leading us, a main big thing that he's doing is he's putting that love in our hearts so that we want to walk down that path. And even though it's really hard sometimes, he keeps us motivated so that we keep going. Mm, so good. And I guess maybe one thing also to add to that is just... You know, you don't have to have some like uh, pull pull a rabbit out of a hat and then, oh, I, I want to buy this house because God told me, uh, no, do you like the house? Uh, can you afford the house? Right. Uh, can, do, you, do you make enough money to, to have the house? Uh, you know, now now we get into other matters like marriage. That's a, that's that's a little different. Right. Where, you know, you want to have the, the church involved in. You know, obviously, premarital counseling, and if you want to get married in the church, and so, so we're not saying like, you know, well, I'm not saying like, hey, you never, you know, look at scripture, but you understand, you know, I think, I think maybe where we should go to help people highlight this is, you know, the hidden will of God, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine, God's kept things from himself, you know, that that's a good thing because let's be honest, we want to already fight over what God has, God has already said. And, you know, he's given us, like you said, uh, his word to, to teach us and to guide us. And there's, there's principles and there's instruction there. Um, and, and so that's, that's good. That's good for us. It, and it helps us to understand, okay, so the house thing, uh, if I have enough money or those kind of things, it's not that I don't seek guidance and to make a good decision from other people. In fact, you do seek guidance. That's that's in Proverbs, you know. In the abundance right. of counselors, there's there's many wisdom. So, you know, can God use the real estate agent to guide you into the home? Absolutely. Um, she has in God's common grace, right? Um, and and uh, there's a, a number of ways that you could you could talk. We could talk about just just that thing, you know. Like you don't need to when you go to the grocery store, you don't need to ask God, "Hey, God, should I should I get the milk? Uh, should I get the cereal?" Uh, yeah, is it Coke or Pepsi, right? Yeah, God, uh, which one do you like? You know, um, uh, yeah. Do, oh, should I get the licorice at the movie theater? Like, like, but we're, but we're not minimizing that everything is theological. Some people would probably hear that. Well, we're we're minimizing that it's that's theological, and uh, it's like no, it's just you have to have some. Unfortunately. Uh, this isn't in the Bible. I, I think it is in the Bible a little bit, but sanctified common sense, you know, uh, God gives us his word and he teaches us. Uh, but we have to have a little bit of common sense to realize, you know, not everything. Um, God doesn't have to tell us, hey, buy this house, get this coat, get this. We we need that food. And he gives us the money to, you know, he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. So he owns all of our money and he gives us the money through our jobs to to get to get food and to have a house and those kind of things. So, yeah, it, it's helpful to, um, to realize, like you were just saying that um, the Bible teaches us and instructs us in more than one way. On the one hand, it, it does give us um, clear moral commandments, prohibitions, um, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. You don't need to pray about that. 
Um, that's just no. But the Bible also gives us uh, wisdom. And wisdom doesn't consist of, in this situation, you always do this. Um, in fact, if you try and live that way, apart from the clear moral principles of God, you're going to get yourself into trouble because you have to be wise. Um, so how are you going to handle this situation? And the Bible gives us a wisdom in our minds. It's, it's like a growing light by which we can see, oh, in this situation, um, this is what would be really good. Uh, this would be the best way to approach this person over this issue at this time. And part of that wisdom is, is right motives. Paul prays for the Philippians that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. And so there's a connection there. Part of the reason we, we don't see clearly sometimes what is right and good and true, the will of God, is because we don't want to see it. Mm. And the, the more that God purifies our hearts, the more that God increases our love for him and other people, that too contributes to the wisdom that we have to say, hey, right now, this is what I should be doing. Even though I can't tell you, you know, chapter and verse, um, this is what it is. Uh, this is what I should be doing right now. That's the wisdom that God develops within us. And it grows as we mature. Amen, brother. That's really well said. You know, you talked about the the means of grace earlier, but what are they, you know, and how do they help the Christian? Mm. Yeah, the means of grace refer to the things that God uses as his instruments to save people and to make them like Christ. So there's a sense in which there's one means of grace. Um, and that's the word of God. That's the great and essential means of grace, the holy scriptures. Uh, Jesus says in John 6, 63, that, that his words are spirit and life. And so, so that means that it's not the Bible itself, which is just a book, but the Bible, the truth that it contains, being the very word of God, is like the channel through which God sends his spiritual life, um, sends his grace into our lives. Now, all the other means of grace are ways in which we either receive the word of God or echo it back to God. So, for example, um, there is uh, preaching the word of God and teaching the word of God. Um, also, just talking the word of God back and forth in our conversations to one another. Um, but there's also prayer. Really, what prayer is, is it's the echo of our hearts to the word of God. God speaks a promise to us in his word. We echo that promise back to God in our prayers. And through that prayer, then God gives us yet more grace. Public worship, um, Psalm 22 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so, and what are we doing when we're praising him? We're singing the word. We're singing the Psalms or, or other songs that are, are written based upon the truths of scripture. And what are called the ordinances of worship or um, the sacraments, uh, the Lord's Supper, baptism, those are really ways in which we see the word. Christ instituted those visible signs, um, not as ways that, you know, like we learn something from baptism or the Lord's Supper that's not in the Bible, but it's a visual representation of dying with Christ, feeding upon Christ, receiving Christ as our life. Mm. And so all those sorts of things, and perhaps others that I've forgotten to mention, are ways in which they're, they're means by which God the Holy Spirit connects us with God the Son and gives us life in a way that grows and grows and grows. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a car has to have gas and oil in mm -hmm. order to go. And the means of grace, you know, don't, don't want everybody break this analogy, okay? But you know, just just listen, like just, just appreciate the analogy, okay? You know, I know it's imperfect. Everyone, every analogy is, but true. You know, car and car, gas and oil. You know, it provides uh, it provides the means that to to go. And these means of grace do the same thing for us. They they fuel us, you know, by grace through the Holy Spirit to go to to be able to to go to rest to enjoy to um to serve and, and to grow in godly character and then to serve god mm. um, you know that's why that's why when we talk about these things you know like you said earlier it is about our motivation it it 
It's not just, okay, am I, am I reading my Bible? Am I praying? Am I blah, 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 doing whatever? Uh, it's like when one person said, are you, are you enjoying your union with Christ, Dave? Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. I've thought about that over the years. And that's really our, that's really a place of our rest and union with Christ. Mm -hmm. Am I enjoying, am I spending time? Do I have the right motivation? Do I have the right, um, yeah, the right motivation in, in my service? Or am I just doing it so that somebody might know Dave Jenkins, which is, which is silly really when you think about it, because we didn't save ourselves. We didn't call ourselves to salvation. We didn't draw ourselves. Um, we, we weren't, uh, some of us were, we were dragged by the spirit. You know, we were all drawn by the spirit. Some of us were dragged by the spirit to, to salvation. And, and so, you know, and we're not kept by our own power. So if you think about it, it's kind of silly to, to not enjoy that, you know, um, to enjoy the, 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 all the privileges, all the rights and all the benefits that we have, you know, because of, of Christ. And what this does, I think, um, is it helps us to understand the right place of Bible reading and um, actually have the proper motivation, what I call, you know, the why. And then that'll help us to do the how in, in the right way. Yeah. God loves us so much. I mean, it's just astonishing how much God loves us, especially when you consider that he doesn't need us at all. Uh, we don't add anything to him, but his heart just gushes love and kindness and mercy towards us. And so just like, you know, going out to eat um, with your wife and taking a walk or something like that, those things, we, we don't do those things just because, man, I want to go out to this restaurant. Um, that totally misses the point. Those are means by which we spend time with the one that we love and the one who loves us. And that's what, what reading the word and prayer and all those things are. They're, they're ways in which God draws near to us and, and makes us more like him so that we can enjoy him more and honor him more. It's all about him. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't think that there's a more confused topic among Christians today than than this. Maybe there is. Uh, but what does the what place does the law have in the life of the Christian today? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think it helps us just to start with what we were talking about uh, before to realize that that the law is from God, and so and God God is love, and so we should never set the law against love or treat the law of God as if it were some kind of a curse. And now the law does curse us before we're in Christ, but that's not because the law is bad. That's because we're bad. Um, but the, the law is good. Paul says in Romans 7 that it's holy, just, and, and good. He even says that the law is spiritual, which means that the law is, is from the Holy Spirit and it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So to make some kind of a, a division and say, well, you know, I, I don't follow, I don't pay any attention to the law of God because I'm led by the Spirit. Um, well, where do you think the law came from? The, the Holy Spirit inspired the law. And so on the one hand, um, we are delivered in Christ from the condemnation of the law, uh, the law's righteous judgments against us, which are well-deserved. We deserve to be condemned, but Christ obeyed the law perfectly in our place. He bore the curse of the law, as Paul says in Rome, uh, Galatians 3. So that's, we're free from that. And Paul also tells us that, uh, that we're free from the obligation to keep the ceremonial laws, such as circumcision. Um, but Paul insists in passages like 1 Corinthians 7, 19, that, that what, what still counts in the Christian life, what's really important is keeping the commandments of God. In fact, um, Paul takes the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, and he applies it directly to children today as their moral duty, Ephesians 6. And so Paul has no hesitancy in applying the law, especially the law, the Ten Commandments, um, to the Christian life. We need to realize that the, the, the function of the law has shifted now that we're in Christ. 
Because before, all the law could do for us was just tell us what to do and then condemn us for not doing it. But now that we're in Christ, the law comes alongside us as, as a friend, as a guide to lead a life pleasing to God. And if we're really Christians, we want to do that. Because as it says in the New Covenant, God has written his law in our hearts so that he's given us that inward motivation to to delight to do his will, as it says in Psalm 40. Mm. So the law is really crucial. It, um, it's been a great, a great evil in the, the life of the contemporary church that the law has been neglected, even disdained. Um, and we really need to use the law well. Again, not to look to it as a savior. It can't even give us the power to obey. But it, we need a, a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. As David says, whoever wrote Psalm 119, we need guidance. We need to know what's right. We need to know what's wrong. Otherwise, people will say, well, uh, God tells us to love each other. And um, I love my girlfriend. And that's why we're sleeping together. You know, if all that we have is our feelings of love, we don't know what's right and wrong. And we end up committing sins because the Bible says that the fornicator and the adulterer, God will judge. Um, we really need that guidance, that that direction, that that map that shows us this is the path to follow. This is the way to please God. This is the way to be like Jesus. Um, and it's such a blessing to our lives. Yeah, yeah. God, by the spirit, like you said, we have to go back to Scripture. And what does God use Scripture to do by the Spirit to convict us? And what does He use to do that? Is law. Mm. And what does He do with the law, the law is meant to, like you said, to point us to Jesus. So uh, he right. even uses a law to comfort us and, and and all those things. And so, yeah, we don't neglect the law. We're not lawless. In fact, <laughs> the whole idea of lawless Christianity, right? Romans 6, shall I continue to live however I want to live? And he and he says empathetically, may it never be. We, we can't live however we want to live because we're indwelt by the Spirit. We're called by the Spirit. We were drawn by the Spirit. We were generated by the Spirit. Uh, we're adopted and, and loved and justified. I mean, my goodness. I mean, you think of all the things that God did at the moment of our salvation. And I'm mm. not saying you tell the, tell the person that you're evangelizing all those things either. But, I mean, just think as a Christian, all those things that God did for you, and he did it to save you. And he did it in a moment. He did it in a very in an instant. And obviously, you know, our sanctification is over a lifetime. Uh, but yeah, I may uh, I should make you say amazing grace, right? I do that's me. Yeah, it that's right. Me. It say it excites me. I'm like, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> why why is the fear of God central to a life of godliness? The fear of God. Well, to be to be clear, we're not talking about a slavish fear here. We're not talking about a fear that that simply frightens people of God's punishment while that person hates and resents God's authority, like a slave who, um, who only obeys because he's afraid that his master is going to mistreat him, um, but he hates his master. Uh, frankly, that, that kind of fear even the demons have. Uh, they, they believe that there's a God and they tremble. Over it. What we're talking about here is a childlike fear, uh, the kind of fear that is that is full of reverence and awe at the majesty and glory of God, um, and it sees that He is righteous and good, and also that He is our Father in Christ, and so we we want to please Him, and that that motivates us to to serve Him. We it's a fear that's mingled with love. Um, and yet, we shouldn't underrate the word fear. It's not just respect. Um, it's, a, it's a trembling awe. Um, now, this kind of godly fear is the inward disposition that moves people to willingly obey God. And that's why it's so important in the Christian life. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Um, and the Bible also tells us that the fear of God is not somehow something that Jesus did away with. Um, in fact, it, it tells us in Isaiah 11 that when the Holy Spirit rests on Christ and anoints Jesus, he comes 
um, amongst other things, as the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so if you want to experience the the spirit of Jesus Christ, um, that will always involve increasing your in your fear of God. A truly spiritual person is a person who fears God. Mm. Um, in fact, the fear of God is, is actually a grace that God gives to us. Um, in, uh, in Jeremiah 32, 40, the Lord says, I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. And so when God chooses someone or when God has chosen someone and God loves that person and saves that person, one of the crucial things that God does is he puts something in that person's heart so that that person will never fully and finally walk away from him. And what is that? It's the fear of the Lord. Uh, In John Bunyan's allegory called the Holy War, um, There's a place in, it's a great story about a city that represents the human soul and the battle between the devil and the forces of good. And after that soul, man's soul, is saved, there is a point where he backslides and the the forces of the devil have infiltrated the city and they're attacking the city, but they're never able to breach the citadel. They're never able to take control of the castle at the heart of the city. And the reason, John Bunyan says, that that's the case is because there's a particular man who has been put in charge of the gate to that citadel, and his name is Mr. Godly Fear. Mm. It's the fear of God that causes us to stick with the Lord, to keep following him, and um, to follow him all the way to the end, no matter how much sin may assail us, no matter how much we may be persecuted. And that's why Jesus teaches us to fear God. Um, he says, don't fear men. who All they can do is kill the body, but fear God who can cast you body and soul into hell. I mean, that's fear, but Jesus commends it to us. Um, Paul commends the fear of God to us. Peter does. Um, so, in fact, it, Dr. Beakey and I have written a, another book that deals with this subject, and it's about John Bunyan. It's called John Bunyan and the Grace of Fearing God. And um, Bunyan has a lot of helpful things to say um, based upon his studies of the fear of God in the Bible. So um, and you might find that book or the uh, listeners might find that book helpful. Excellent. It's a great answer. Really good. What is sober watchfulness and why should Christians be concerned with its practice? The issue of sober watchfulness ties into the issue of whether or not the Christian views himself as someone who lives in um, peacetime or in a state of war. If we're civilians and we're at peace with the world around us and sin inside of us, um, then if you're at peace, you can relax. Your biggest concerns are where are you going to go for vacation, so on and so forth. But if you're a soldier and you're in the midst of the battle, and you know that there are enemies out there that that they aim to destroy you, to destroy your family, to destroy your church, and and they are not easily identified, they're they're sneaky, they're deceitful, then you will be alert. You will be watching, and you will try and maintain a sober, wakeful mindset that is thinking clearly at all times because you know that you are always in danger. Um, Now, that is mingled with a confidence that our great captain is leading us forward and he's already won the victory. But it's also mingled with a recognition that that we can still screw up big time and cause great harm to ourselves and to other people. Sober watchfulness is also connected with watching and waiting for Jesus to return. Because we know that this battle that we're in will one day come to an end when the great invasion takes place, so to speak, when Jesus comes back. And so we have texts like Peter saying in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Hmm. Or we think about what Jesus said to Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
And so that's another aspect of being sober minded is sober minded, watchful people are ready to pray. And they do pray often because they're calling in the Lord's help. They're calling upon the Lord's assistance in this spiritual war. And they're also calling on Jesus to come back soon because they long for his appearing. So good. So good. There's a really good book by Brian Hedges on. Watching. Yes, there is. It's an excellent book. So good. In fact, our listeners can go back in the in the archives and, and find an episode on that. And I, and I would encourage you to do that, but also check out Brian's book and um, for, for more on this, it's, it's really, really good. What, what should a professing Christian do if he discovers he is backslid? Well, backsliding is, um, it's a state where a Christian has sinned, but didn't repent. And they keep sinning. And they're not repenting of some particular sin or maybe a group of sins. The normal Christian life is a life where we do repeatedly sin and we confess it and we repent. Unfortunately, that's true. But backsliding is when that, excuse me, that cycle gets interrupted. And as a result, the person begins to slide away from the Lord, their faith and repentance weaken. And so I think the first thing that somebody needs to do if they realize that they're backsliding is they need to realize the magnitude of the grace of God towards them, that God still loves them. And they've not gone so far that they can't turn back. Oftentimes people, when they've been backsliding, especially if they are true believers, they feel terrible about it. Um, And they, they have a tremendous amount of guilt This is assuming that they've been awakened to their backsliding and they're not continuing to deceive themselves. But they also might feel a sense of despair. Maybe they've committed some really big sins. Um, Or maybe it's just been that constant drip, drip, drip of small sins that have poisoned their attitude towards God or people. Um, Boy, they need to realize that, that the grace of God is far greater than any sins that they've committed. And basically what they need to do is is they need to start repenting again, and they need to start exercising faith in Jesus again as the one who has all that grace. So they need to face their sins instead of excusing them. They need to grieve over them. Joel says, rend your heart and not your garments. Tear yourself on the inside over the way that you've been acting. Look to Jesus. Christ has grace to um, to forgive us of our sins, to to change our hearts, to comfort us. Jesus has the grace that we need to keep going, even when we feel utterly depleted of strength in ourselves. So it's it's not really complicated, but being in a backslidden state can be complicated because of the way that sin has affected us. Uh, Dr. Beakey has written a very helpful book on this subject. It's called Getting Back into the Race, The Cure for Backsliding. And it's really an exposition of um, Hosea 14, um, which is addressed to the backsliding Israelites. I would commend it to the readers. Excellent. Excellent answer. Yeah, very good. Where can people go to find out more about you, either online, on social media, or otherwise, brother? Well, I'm not very active in terms of social media, to be honest with you. So... Um, They could find a few articles that I've written at uh, the Credo Magazine website. Um, I believe there's one at the Crossway website as well. Any of the books that Dr. Beakey and I have co-authored can be found at Reformation Heritage Books, their website. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, there's a lot that we could really dive into about this topic and People might be like, well, you covered a lot of ground. Yeah, we, we did, but there's still yet more, more depth, believe me. Um, And just as we wrap up, can you give us a few takeaways, bro? Sure. We've talked about a number of specific theological issues, but what I'd like to do as we wrap up is take a step back and just talk about doing theology as a whole. Mm. Um, So first of all, I'd say it's just crucial that we study theology for the right reasons. Um, The Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. And so if we're studying theology just to get a big head and a big ego, and we're actually fighting against God, and we'll find him fighting against us. Mm. The purpose of studying theology has to be so that we can know God and so that we can make him known. Mm. Um, 
William Ames defined theology as the doctrine of living to God. Um, so that the Bible's our training manual, so to speak, on how to live a life that is towards God in every way. And Petrus von Maastricht uh, changed that definition just a little bit to the doctrine of living to God by Christ. And so whenever you do theology, do it as one who's depending upon Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator of all truth, godliness, comfort, joy, eternal life. Um, do theology as you read theological books, as you listen to podcasts, so that through Jesus and his grace, you will live more to the glory of God alone. Second of all, um, I would say make sure that you don't spend more time reading theological books than you do spend reading the Bible itself. You know, I love theological books. I have lots of theological books. Um, but the best thing that, you know, the Reformers or the Puritans or Augustine or people like that can do for us is to help us to understand and apply the Bible better. And so if you're reading along in one of these books and there's something that they've said that really strikes you, use that as an opportunity to go back to the scriptures. Have your Bible open um, or at least have it available when, uh, when you're reading these things. Go back to see what God says. Because you can't build your life on what Anselm or Martin Luther or these other great theologians have said. You've got to build your life on, on the word. The last thing I would say is beware of doing theology and studying it in an individualistic manner. Um, boy, there's a lot that could be said about this, but let me just say this. You're not doing theology correctly unless you're doing it as a faithful member of a local church. Um, you won't fully understand the Bible unless you're trying to live the Bible in friendships with other believers. Um, hey, let's just think about it. We've talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do for us when he saves us? He connects us to the body of Christ. He, he creates a union and a communion between us and Christ and, and all the other believers. And so if we really want to know and experience the Holy Spirit, Yes, we do that by studying the Bible, but we do that as the body. We have to let other people teach us. We have to be in church listening. We have, we have to have people who are preaching to us. We have to have people to, who can talk to us about things. And frankly, we need people who can rebuke us and correct us and, and say, hey, brother, you're, I hear what you say, but I see how you live and, and you need to correct this. Um, and we also need brethren to help us. Because one of the biggest parts of living the Christian life is dealing with suffering, um, dealing with temptation and sorrow. And we're just not designed to go through those things without the help of brothers and sisters. So I would really urge people to, yes, do theology, read theology, um, do it in the word, but don't do it by yourself. Um, and, and listen, John Owen is great, but he's dead. So you need other people as well. Mm. Amen. Amen. Really, really good, brother. Really good. Well, guys, we've been talking today with uh, Paul Smalley. Uh, he is the author with Dr. Joel Beakey of Reform Systematic Theology, Volume 3, Spirit and Salvation. I commend it to you. It is, It is. Uh, if you're a big theology nerd, you'll love it because it's, it's what, like 1,000 pages, 1,200 pages, right? It's big. Yeah, yeah. 1,200 pages. Uh, you'll you'll not only learn a lot, you'll benefit from it. And thank you so much, Paul, for your time uh, today, your time writing with Dr. Beakey and research. Uh, it's been a blessing to talk to you. Thank you. It's been a privilege to be part of your program. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, at Servants of Grace, on Instagram, at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.